This printer right next to me is probably about the least expensive large format, and we're talking 300 by 300 by 400 3D printer on the market today. My question, is it any good? Hi there, my name is Nils and welcome to the 3D Printing Zone. Today we're taking a look at the longer LK5 Pro, which comes in at under $320, and depending on the price and the discounts that you see, we're seeing these go as low as $288 US dollars. A fantastic price for a large printer that has a lot of features. Let's see if it holds up to all the hype. Now right out of the gate, I wanna let you know that while this is a sponsored video, I got permission from the manufacturer to go ahead and review everything that this thing does really well, as well as the things that it just isn't doing so great. So there are a few of those that I wanna to cover to make sure you're aware of exactly what you're getting when you look at a printer like this. Another thing that you should be aware of is that this is one of 23 printers that I've owned. So I've been able to see a lot of what works and what doesn't. I have some favorite things about 3D printing and some not so favorite things, especially when it comes to hardware. So we'll cover those as well. Now right off the bat, this printer impresses me with a few of the things that it does that I haven't seen a lot of. Now you've probably noticed right away that there are some triangular bars coming right up here. These are support braces. This is a very tall gantry. Because this can print 400 millimeters, which is just shy of 16 inches, that's, you know, it introduces some opportunity for some wobble up here. So imagine if you're printing something very tall, you don't wanna get shaking or different lines or ghosting or anything like that at those top layers. So they've put these bars on here that are stabilizers and they turn it into more of a triangle shape, making it very rigid and solid. In fact, while this is printing, I can move this thing around or try to, and it just stays really solid, doesn't go anywhere. So I love that they added those. I've actually purchased those to put on other printers of this same format before and never got around to it, but this thing comes with them right out of the box. Now speaking of right out of the box, the actual unboxing experience with this was very pleasant. It comes in a fairly flat pack box that's probably about eight inches tall. It's pretty wide, kind of heavy, but you know, just what you would expect with a 3D printer. And the actual assembly experience was not bad at all. It was actually fairly typical. This is about 90% pre-assembled for you. So you're basically just putting the gantry together, putting the x-axis onto it, and then connecting everything up. It goes pretty quickly. You can see in the time lapse here, this took me about 45 minutes to put together. I didn't get hung up on anything. There was nothing that seemed just confusing or very difficult. I will say this is not the best experience I've had as far as documentation. You can download documents, but what it comes with is just this little fold out piece of paper here with all of the steps one through seven. And it's fine, it's okay. If you've done these before, then it actually goes pretty quickly. But I imagine for a first timer, a better guide would actually be quite helpful. Um, you might also wanna check out some of the assembly videos that are available online to walk you through that because some of the things might not be all that intuitive unless you've done this before. Some other first impressions dealing with that unboxing, I noticed for one thing, it didn't come with any snips. Now I love to have a good set of snips like these, um, basically with every 3D printer. I imagine if you're buying this as your first one, you need a set of these, it doesn't come with those, so that's something to be aware of. It does come with a sharpened spatula, which is really nice. This is great for getting your prints off the bed, especially when they're really tricky, and I also think that they should all come with this. It does have the USB-A to USB-B cable, so it's got really just about everything you need to get started. It's got a little bit of filament, hardly any, not even like a quarter spool or anything like that, just a sample essentially, but no snips. So make sure that you get yourself a pair of those, and I'll put links in the description below for a pair that I would recommend. Now as far as noise, this is a generally very quiet printer. It uses three of the TMC2208 chipsets for the X, Y, and Z motors. And you should know, however, it does not include that 2208 on the extruder motor. I'm not sure why they excluded it on that one. So this one makes more noise than the rest, but it's really not making much noise. If you have a lot of retraction going on, then you're gonna notice that. If not, you won't. I'm trying purposely to actually record this whole video right next to it so you can kind of get a feel for it. It's a pretty quiet printer. By far, the fan and the power supply is the noisiest part of the whole printing experience. Now, if you enjoy modding your 3D printers or upgrading the firmware, anything like that, you'll want to know that this actually does come with open source mainboard, which means that you can put a different flavor of Marlin on there, you can add a BL Touch, 
you can make whatever changes that you want to make to it thanks to that open source mainboard. The interface that comes on this is new to me. I haven't actually seen an interface exactly like this and I actually really like this interface. We've got a 4.3 inch touchscreen on here and the menu system is great. I feel like the more time goes on, the better these UIs get as far as being able to navigate around, do what you want to do. One of the things I really like on it is as it's printing, it does show you the exact Z height and then it gives you the option to pause and make some updates to the flow and other areas of your print as well. The actual touchscreen interface for this is just this nice little panel mounted right here on the front. There's nothing behind it, no bulk, and all of the rest of the CPU and everything that's in here is actually underneath the printer. So it's not a separate unit like some of the older ones used to be. Another upgrade they've done is making it so that the Teflon tube here that runs from the extruder to the hot end is actually capable of handling up to 280 degrees. Now I've actually never needed to print at that temperature, but if you do need that or have a filament that requires such a high temperature, it shouldn't be a problem with this. Now there are two features that I see all the time on printers today that I kind of expect. It's almost kind of a given that on most new printers, unless they're the super budget ones, it should have. One is a filament runout sensor. So right here, it does have a little sensor that as the filament's going in, if it runs out, it will pause the print and let you change that. It puts a little message on the screen and you're good to go. The other one is power failure detection. So if the power gets cut for any reason, then it will allow you to resume exactly where you left off after the power is restored. Now the beds that are coming with 3D printers these days are getting better and better, but we are seeing more of a variety of them. This one comes with a glass bed that has a coating on here that's not identified. So I don't know if this is a carborundum bed, and if you don't know, I love carborundum beds because they tend to, when they heat up, they hold on to everything really well, and when they cool down, they totally release what's on the bed. This one is mostly doing that. It doesn't do it quite as well as a full-on carborundum bed, so I'm not sure if it's that or something else, but it is easy to pop the prints off as soon as the bed starts to cool, which is really great. And you can see that in these examples here. Now, because this is a coated glass bed, you can, of course, flip it over and just use the straight glass side if you prefer that. Of course, you can use that with some masking tape or with some glue, anything that you like. For me, I've just been using the coated side of the glass bed the entire time, and it's worked out flawlessly. One note on that is if you like to print with PETG, then you'll wanna make sure you put some sort of coating barrier on there, whether that's some tape or some glue. I printed some PETG and I just put some glue stick glue on there and everything popped off just the way it should. Didn't give me any issues. It held down great, but it also released very easily. So let's talk about scale for a second here because I wanna give you a feel for exactly what you can print on something this big. So I've got this old Iron Man helmet here that is kind of a crappy print that I did on another printer, but it gives you a sense of scale and size. So this thing can fit on my head pretty comfortably and this can easily fit on the longer. So you can actually print this on the LK5 Pro without a problem. Now moving on to something a little bit bigger here, we have the Mandalorian helmet. And again, this is a full size helmet. It fits on pretty well. This thing can easily be printed on the longer LK5 Pro as well. Now, taking it one step further, we have the old school Star Wars Stormtrooper helmet, and these things are really large. And this entire thing can be printed in one go on the LK5 Pro. So it all fits on that 300 by 300 size. The 400 gives you plenty to work with. Some people ask why I have these gigantic uh, digital calipers, and they go out to 300, and you can see we've got plenty of room there, especially if you turn this thing at a little bit of an angle, you can print this whole thing in one go, which I think is pretty rad. So this is by far, uh, probably the most comfortable and kind of bang for your buck size that you can get when it comes to 3D printing. A 200 by 200 or 250 by 250 is great. It's pretty good for most things, but if you want to do something a little bit larger, it really helps to have a larger bed like this. And one of the questions I get is what about even bed heating and things like that, as well as getting a good nice level bed for moving around. And we'll cover that in just a little bit, but for the most part, this can handle all of that really well so that you can print anywhere on that large surface and get whatever kind of results that you need. Now I'm doing a little bit of a bed temperature test here and you can see we're at about 57.8, 57.9. So this is supposed to be at 60 everywhere and it's pretty close to that, certainly not perfect. So I'm looking at the white number right in the beginning, 59 degrees. And if we go out towards the corners here and it's getting down in the 58 region, 
Let's go in the front one. That one looks coolest to me. And that one gets down as low as 50. And the very corner, we're getting down in the 55s, it looked like it was for a second there. Yeah, 56, 55. That one's even saying 54s. So those outer corners, yeah, over here it's a little lower for sure, 53, 54. So that's something to be aware of. It's not totally consistent all the way throughout the bed. And, but mostly it's staying in within about five Celsius of the rest of the bed. Now you may have noticed that I actually don't have anything showing on the screen here relating to the print that's happening right now. And that's because this thing works wonderfully with OctoPrint and OctoPi. So this is a Raspberry Pi that I've got connected to it right now via the included USB cable. And then that acts as a little server essentially that I can send prints to it remotely. And if you're not familiar with OctoPrint, you're definitely gonna wanna check it out. I've got a video that you can see up in the corner here that shows you exactly how to set that up and some of the great features about OctoPrint. Now with this one, I had another OctoPrint that I had set up for another printer. And for me to add this one, seriously took about three minutes to get it set up, connected, up and running. It works out of the box, I had no issues, and the print that I'm doing right now is being controlled via OctoPrint and it's working really smoothly. I'm also running a time lapse just off camera here. I've got a webcam that's pointing at this and every time it gets to a new layer, it's taking a snapshot to give me a nice buttery smooth time lapse of the print that's going on right now. So that works great. I can totally endorse that as being fully functional with the LK5 Pro. Now let's talk about print quality and what this thing can do. So one of the tests I ran was in vase mode or outer spiralized contour and this thing did a pretty clean job. You can see that this is actually just one set of outer perimeter all the way through and on this rocket everything looks really nice and smooth so I'm pretty impressed with how well it was able to handle that. There's no stringing, there's no um, you know lower quality areas or issues or anything like that. The entire thing from top to bottom looks just about flawless. In fact I can't think of much I would actually need to change on this at all. So it did a really great job with this keeping everything nice and smooth. This is really thin, so it will bend in just like that, but it kept all of the layers welded together really well. I didn't have to do much as far as settings. I just kind of put some standard settings on it, put it into spiralized contour mode in Cura, and it was good to go. So very impressed with how well this did. It came right off the bed really easily as well, and just definitely pretty impressed with that one. Now another one I wanted to show, this was kind of a torture test for this thing. This is an extending lightsaber, um, I don't know what you call it, the actual saber part of it. This is something that you can actually print in place. And this is a tricky one to print because if you see here, all of those layers have to be able to print one right next to another with very little tolerance there. And so it's gotta just work just right. If it prints too wide, if it overflows too much, if the seam is kind of a little thick, then this won't work. But I printed this whole thing. I did put a little raft on the bottom, so I had to cut open the raft. But as soon as I did that, and then pried it a little bit, I had to work at it. It wasn't like the easiest thing. But all of these slide independently now. And you can have a full-on little lightsaber that slides out, and it works just as it should. In fact, so well that I can just do that, and this thing comes out. On to the Benchy. So this is kind of a uh, must print for any new printer. You wanna see exactly what the overhangs look like inside here, how smooth the walls are on the outside, and just how it can handle a benchmark print like this. So if you look at the top of it, you can see it's got some definite ridging in here, which is pretty standard. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't had too many printers that don't do that. But one of the things I was most impressed by is how smooth this is. Now this is the Benchy that came on the TF card that comes with the printer. And so it just printed just like this. In fact, this was one of our first prints that we did with the printer. All we had done was uh, assembled it and leveled the bed and then hit print on this guy. And I am really impressed. This thing looks really good. There's no real stringing. There's a teeny little bit that you can maybe see in there. I'm not sure. Yeah, there you go. You can kind of see it and that's it. Um, I haven't removed any strings or anything like that. But all in all, this thing came out pretty darn smooth and the windows and the doors came out pretty good with the arches. There's a little bit of a blip in the top of the arch right there, but not too bad. But again, I was mostly impressed with the, the wall here. There is a bit of a seam that you can tell right here. You can see a little rough spot, 
but looks pretty good as far as the Benchy is concerned. I'm pretty happy with that. We also did the XYZ calibration cube and this one I measured and this one came out really good and all of the walls are pretty um, just about perfect. The one thing I did notice is there is a little bit of ghosting and it's subtle but you can kind of just barely see a little bit of ghosting uh, around the different letters and that happened really on all of the axes so just something to be aware of. I think that's something that can be adjusted or fixed in some of the settings a little bit so I will play around with that and see if we can get that a little bit better but all in all it came out really good popped right off just like it should and had no issues and again this is one of our very early prints on this one of the first things we printed. Now another one that came on the TF card itself is this whistle and I've printed these before. These are pretty fun because it's a totally functioning whistle. You can kind of see I, I printed this with a transparent filament that I had some samples of and you can maybe see in there there's a little ball rolling around and so it works just like it should. It's nice and loud. With the transparent you can definitely see the infill pattern in there but it printed really smoothly. So this one prints on its side like this and really had no issues. So here we go. Woof, that is deafening, but yeah, definitely works. Now lastly, the all important 3D printer test. I've printed this one on several different printers so far so that we can kind of compare them and see what works and what doesn't. Uh, this is in the gold PLA, so that kind of really helps to shine and kind of show what works and what doesn't. First thing you'll notice is there's some definite stringing going on. And again, that has to do with your retraction settings, both your retraction distance and your retraction speed. And so that's something I'm going to need to work on. So that's all the stringing that we're seeing between the towers and also over here um, next to the start of the overhang tests. So some definite stringing there and something that needs to be fixed. In fact, I'm seeing stringing on most of my prints almost no matter what I do. And so I'm going to have to really be aggressive with the retraction on this in order to counteract that stringing that's happening. Now as far as the actual quality inside here, you can see that it actually looks pretty darn good. So most of the uh, text is readable, like the whole test there, 3D printer test. Not the best I've seen, but definitely very passable. And then my favorite thing to check out here is the overhang test. So right here, this one goes up to 75 degrees, this smaller one. And then the bigger one goes up to, let's see, what does that say? 80 degrees. So that one's in increments of 10. And you can see at 70 degrees, it's actually almost perfect. There's a little bit of um, fallout that's happening right there. At 80 degrees it definitely doesn't handle that very well, but 80 is very extreme. So I think I would feel comfortable printing up to about 60 or 65 degrees without the need of any supports. So it handles that quite well. And another thing we can take a look at with that is the bridge test right down here. So it's hard to see because this is so small, but you can see it can bridge from this area over here all the way over to there. It's about one inch and it handles that really smoothly. There's very little sagging hap happening underneath there, even on a one inch bridge. So not too bad. And again, I think with some adjustments to the fan, we might be able to get that to go even further. So that's a lot of compliments and great things about the longer LK5 Pro. Let's talk about some of the things that I don't love on it. Now one of them is the size of the little wheels here for leveling. These are pretty small. So, I mean, it's not that big a deal to make them bigger and it just makes life easier. I have the Ender 3 V2. It's got wheels that are about twice this big and it's so much easier to do little micro adjustments to get that first level just right. So definitely something I wish they would have just included were some bigger wheels on here. Now just like with most printers, you can print your own wheels for that and that's probably what I'll end up doing on here just to give myself a little more micro control over the bed leveling. Here on the back side of the printer we have a single lead screw for the Z-axis. And most of the higher end printers do have dual Z-axis lead screws and motors. So it would be nice if it had that. That said, I'm not 100% certain how much impact that actually has on the quality of the prints. It does help to keep the Z-axis, or excuse me, the X-axis nice and parallel to the bed. So that's something I think would help quite a bit, but definitely only one on the LK5 Pro. Another thing that stood out to me is that the feet on these, I don't know if they're even rubber at all, um, there's really not much to them and it's been proven that a good set of rubber feet goes a long way when reducing the vibrations on a 3D printer. These feet really in my opinion don't pass the test. I mean they really just could throw some thicker rubber feet on there on all four legs. Instead they look like this and they don't do much at all to absorb any of the vibration that's happening that's being passed down through the printer especially onto the desk if there's any vibration there. Like most printers, the x-axis belt tension can be adjusted by adjusting these two screws right here, which is really convenient. 
and the tension for the Y belt can be adjusted with these two screws right here. Now this printer actually is capable of working on either 115 volt or 230, but it's kind of weird that they put it behind this sticker here that you have to peel off and it's got the little switch back there. It's defaulted to 230, so I had to open that up and then switch it over to the 115 in my case here in the United States. But just something to be aware of, it should work pretty much anywhere in the world. So going back to my original question at the beginning, is this printer any good? We know it is just about the least expensive 3D printer that prints at such a large size. It has a lot of features that we've talked about. It has some flaws and setbacks as well, but in general I would say this is actually a pretty fantastic printer. Something that I would recommend. In fact, I was just telling my wife when we started looking at 3D printers several years ago, I picked, picked up a TiVo Tornado and that was um, actually one of the only printers I found that's less expensive than this and around that same size. It has almost none of the features that this one has, including the stabilizer bars, the filament runout detection, the power failure recovery, the 4.3 inch touchscreen, on and on and on. This, this is by far a much better printer and it's actually right now, for the next month, even less expensive than that. It's coming in at $287.99 with the coupon that comes with it. The normal price for this is $319.99, which is a steal by itself, but if you look in the description below, from now for the next month, starting today, you'll be able to get this printer for $287.99. Now even after that expires, check the description below. I'll include any discounts that are available, whether it's a coupon or a sale that's going on so you can try to get the cheapest price with the longer LK5 Pro. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to check out my video on how to set up OctoPrint. It's something that makes this and just about every other printer so much easier to use. It brings on all kinds of new features and it makes it so that you can handle all of your prints remotely without the need to transfer cards or plug in via a USB port. I'm Nils with the 3D Printing Zone. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.